Well, good afternoon. Very warm welcome to uh, Wycliffe Hall this afternoon and back in the cosier environment of uh, the Vice Principal's study, having last time been in the chapel with um, N.T. Wright um, for his book launch. Slightly fewer people this time. Slightly fewer people, yes. but... Um, but quality. Indeed, exactly. Um, nothing like queuing yourself up. Uh, <laughs> great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Lloyd, um, new principal of Wycliffe Hall, my new boss. Um, and he is here just so you can get to know him a little bit better and also to speak about the problem of evil. Indeed. Have you had a lot of experience of evil? Well, in the last couple of months, I'm catching up for lost time, obviously, with the people that I lie manage. That kind of yeah, indeed, thing. exactly. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, so that the viewers can feel like they've got to know Michael Lloyd a little bit. OK. Um, well, the kind of practical side of things is uh, I was at Oxford College chaplain before coming here. I was at uh, chaplain at Queen's College and also taught at St. Politis College, which is a, a kind of new, new theological training centre in London. So that's what I've been doing. Um, what, what can I tell you about myself? I think the thing I like best is I think a friend said to me once that, that, that I was the only person they knew who could simultaneously lower and raise the tone of any conversation. Well, we look forward to that. <laughs> well, you may only get one. <laughs> yes, and um, just tell us a little about some formative influences in your life, particularly coming to faith and what sort of in God's problems led to that point of you becoming a believer? Yes. I, <clears throat> I was brought up in a, in a Christian family from about the age of five. Um, until then, my parents were kind mm. of occasional uh, churchgoers, um, a bit, bit more than social Christians, but I think it wasn't a kind of living personal faith. And then we had a, a, a really difficult time as a family. My eldest brother um, had uh, a brain tumour grow and uh, had to be operated on a huge amount of stress and, and obviously anxiety as to whether he was going to pull through that. Mm. Um, and my mum kind of quit coat while she had to and then had a, a fairly massive breakdown mm. after that. And somebody suggested that she go and visit a uh, Christian nursing home, stroke home of healing in Kent. And uh, so she went there to try and recuperate. My dad went there as an odd job man just to be with her. Mm. Um, and it was really through that that their faith became a, a personal mm. living thing. That happened when I was about five. So from then on, um, I was brought up in an increasingly Christian family yeah. and just imbibed it, grew with it. Um, all the way through, actually, till the last year before the last year of theological college, uh, when I suddenly thought, "Oh my goodness!" I was hit by a kind of wave of depression and doubt, and had to rethink the whole thing mm. from scratch. I think this often happens with Christ people from Christian families; that they always have to lose their faith in order to regain it as their own and first hand, rather than a, an inherited second hand thing. So I, I must often say it's a little bit like the, the violinist Yehudi Menuhin, who was a child prodigy and recorded the Elgar Concerto with Elgar conducting age 60. Mm. I mean, he was age 60. Um, and then woke up when he was in his 20s one morning and couldn't play mm. because it had all been so instinctive. He'd never had to think about it. But as soon as he began to think about it, he couldn't do it and had to start again right, right. from scratch uh, and, and was never probably technically as proficient again, mm. but had a depth of musicality um, that came from that relearning experience, and I think it's the same for, for me. Really. Mm. Well, that's very interesting. And um, I understand that your students and similitis named you Dr. Evil. <laughs> ah. yes. So um, just tell us a little bit about how you managed to acquire that particular reputation. Uh, well, I like to think it's because I um, did my doctoral study on the problem of evil. Mm, so uh, that's what you think. That's what yeah. I think, yes. And um, I want when I finally publish my, my big evil book <laughs> and my academic tome on the subjects to have a picture of me stroking a white cat <laughs> on the back page, but I think academic publishers are going to be a bit sniffy they around that. Kind of sniffy thing. About they might, yes. But, I mean, joking aside, had, was it partly as a result of your background that you got into studying that topic? Well, or? interestingly not, I think, or at least not consciously. I think um, it really came from... Uh, the, the discussions I was having with people, with my non-Christian friends, and, and realizing there was a great hole in my argument. Mm -hmm. uh, that I thought the free will argument, very successful, mm -hmm. worked very nicely for moral evil, for nasty things people do to each other, so murders mm -hmm. and muggings and that sort of thing. 
on today and the anniversary of the shooting of JFK. I mean, it works, I think, reasonably well in terms of explaining that kind of um, experience of evil. It doesn't help you particularly to cope with it, mm. but, but it does help explain it. Um, whereas it didn't seem to work, the free will argument did not seem to work for, for natural evil. So the nasty things that happen to you regardless of human yeah. beings, without any human agency, that almost seem to be built into the way things are. Um, and I, so when my professor at Durham suggested that, that I take an academic ministry seriously and to do a doctorate, I thought, well, this is something I'd like to explore because I know that there's a, a, a hole in my argument there and I'd mm. like there not to be. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, it's, it's a far from academic subject. I mean, it's, it's a the reality of life for, for people. How do we deal with, with the problem of evil? Well, absolutely. It is something that everybody asks at mm. some point or other. And that was one of the good things about doing my doctorate is that you know, if you're studying the Flemish ribbon, ribbon trade between 1482 and 1487, um, you begin to wonder if anybody's ever going to care. Yeah. Whereas when if you're studying the problem of evil, you just know that everybody at some point faces these kind of questions, that they're of deep, visceral importance Absolutely. to people. Yeah. And, uh, and being academic about it simply means thinking hard about it. And, and it, warranted it, it warranted that kind of attention. Right? In fact, I think people who suffer deserve having this question looked at hard yeah, and sure. intelligently yeah. and sustainably. Um, we have no other, uh, obvious sponsor for these broadcasts, so there's no time for a commercial break or anything like that. But I will will give you a few um, adverts at, at this point. Um, you've mentioned 150th anniversary already, but yes. of course um, today is, is is the 50th anniversary of the death of C.S. Lewis, and I just wanted to remind people of um, the summer school, uh, which will be hosted in Wicklow Hall, 22nd to 27th of June. If you're watching online, you can. Um, uh, click the link to to, uh, to to book in for that as well. But of course, um, C.S. Lewis had quite a lot to say about this particular subject, not least the problem of pain and and his own um, bereavement and, and things like that. Did you look at C.S. Lewis? I, 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 did, I did indeed, and it wasn't actually until after I come up with my answer, I suddenly realised that he had the same answer. <laughs> so it was just a kind of relief, and uh, but thankfully hadn't written a lot about it this particular bit of it, so there was still left, room left for me to, mm. to write my thesis. Um, but w w that will be one of the topics that we'll be looking at mm. uh, at the summer school, and so it would be good to take that in a bit more depth. But he's, he actually, of course, both wrote his book, The Problem of Pain, but also the book, the really profound and moving book about uh, observe, a grief observed, observed yeah. um, when his wife died. Mm. So he <clears> both <throat> thought about it and felt it, mm. and you get both of those from him. That's true. Yes, yeah, so anyway, more, more details are on the website. And also, um, ah. shameless plug for um, this uh, weighty tome entitled Cafe Theology by Dr. Michael Lloyd. Um, and chapter two in particular deals with this with this issue, and, and we'll delve into that in a little bit. That's why it's the only chapter you've read, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, I couldn't possibly comment. Uh, and uh, I do want to actually commend it in terms of a, as, a, as a writing style, because um, the, uh, the humor and the accessibility is here, but also um, an introduction to Christian doctrine um, at a, a readable level. So and of course, that's what people always say when they disagree with the content. The style's wonderful. <laughs> Putting words in my mouth. <laughs> Okay, so perhaps without reading that chapter out, yes. maybe we could talk um, a little bit about the vexed question of the problem of evil. Could you perhaps begin by telling us sort of some of the parameters of that discussion in terms of um, uh, what things about God, what things about humanity, what things about free will, what things about God and God's intervention did you sort of take into account as you start to try and answer that question? Well, I suppose the key one is, is the goodness of God. Mm. Uh, somebody asked me what I wanted on my tombstone recently, which was, I thought, a little premature. Um, but I thought for a moment, I thought what I'd like is the phrase, a theologian of the goodness of God. Mm. Because <clears throat> uh, one John talks about you know, how God is light. This is our message. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Mm. The goodness of God is part of the Christian message. It's part of the good news. Uh, and if you think, of, you know, in an the ancient world, the gods were not particularly good. Mm. Uh, they were mixed. They were just like us. They were kind of bits of good and bits of bad projected onto a huge cosmic screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, you never quite knew whether a particular god 
was going to be on your side or going to be against you. You never quite knew when they were going to attack you or, or, or whatever. So the, the anxiety is an anxiety-based worldview paganism, whereas the utter solidity and immovability of the goodness of God, you know, as news, mm. and it's news because it comes out of what they just experienced in Jesus, uh, is phenomenally good news, it seems to me, and, and also has an effect on, on our mental health, I think. If you yeah. believe that you're created by somebody who is fundamentally and utterly good and sustained in being by that, by that good God, that there is goodness when all around you may be very mixed and, and, and worse sometimes, to know that this is not the ultimate reality. The utter goodness and love of God is the ultimate reality, is I think something that stabilizes us um, mentally and emotionally. So, how would you go about persuading the unpersuaded about that fact? Because, of course, you know, 25 years ago when I started out as a preacher and, as a, and doing bits of apologetics, I mean, one of the challenges was um, to help people see that God is not irrelevant, he's not dead, and he and he's engaged in his world. Whereas, of course, the, the mood music now of the sort of new atheist is that actually it's not, that the issue is not indifference. Religion is is wicked. I mean, you know, that it, it's a pernicious force in our cultural discourse today. So, I mean, how would you engage in that conversation over the goodness of God in, in, in a worldview that now thinks that actually the, the religion is bad? Well, I, I think in some ways we've contributed to that new music. Uh, and, and at least as a first point, we need to stop making that contribution to new music. And one of the ways I think that we've contributed to it is by seeing God as being behind suffering or in favor of it, that it comes from him, that he desires it. That it and that view, and it's built into a whole lot of kind of popular apologetics on the, on the problem of evil, um, actually makes, is, has the danger of making God people's enemy. Um, now, I think God does not desire it. He's, he did not intend it. That the world now is not as he created it to be, as he intended it to be. Uh, and as we see in the person of Jesus, that actually wherever we see Jesus, he's attacking suffering. He never says to somebody he heals or who comes to him with some condition or sickness or illness or whatever. He never says, um, I'm sorry, it's doing you good. Uh, it's, it, God sent it, you just need to bear up under it. He never says that. He always attacks it. Um, he, he seems to be against suffering, not behind it. Now, if we could get that message across, both by our theology, but also by our, our practice, and the church, remember, has been uh, the force behind the hospital movement and the hospice yeah. movement. Yeah. You know, at its best, it has done that. It has said, God is on your side. He's against what it afflicts you. He's against what constrains you and constricts you. Uh, he's, and he's for you um, and against cancer and against earthquakes damaging your property and family. Um, then I think we'll begin to win people around to see that maybe the God that they fear is not to be feared in that way, um, right. but, but can be trusted and can be loved. Now, of course, one of the, the difficulties of this conversation is that it mushrooms out into lots of other areas of theology, and I think I've kind and of... And beyond got, philosophy and well, everything else, history. Of course, yeah. you know, yes, as if, as if I had as if not really provided enough. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so I sort of kind of promised that we would try not to get too sidetracked on solving every other problem. Yep. So let's just stick with the problem of evil for now. Yes. Um, and just help us understand how you arrive at the conclusion you do about the origin of evil. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the implications of, of, of the position you take. Yes. Well, as I say, the, the first step is to look at the problem of, of moral evil, and I'll see things people do to each other. Now, there, <coughs> I think, the free will argument works quite well. It's a way of saying that um, if we are genuinely free, if we're genuinely other than God, distinct from him, not controlled by him, uh, then we have to be free to do um, what is bad as well as what is good. Otherwise, we are actually just robots. Actually, we don't have any significance. Um, we're just extensions of God. We're not really separate beings at all. We couldn't actually have a relationship with God because we'd be just extensions of who he is. Mm -hmm. Because he creates us different other than himself, in order to have a relationship with us, therefore we intrinsically have the freedom to do things of which he disapproves. Mm. Uh, and and that, that's a good thing that we have that freedom, because otherwise we'd be meaningless, and 
because um, otherwise we wouldn't be able to have a relationship with him. Uh, but and, and because it means that we are significant. What we do has an impact. It, it actually impacts for good or for ill on, on others around us. Uh, and that is, is a fraught thing and a dangerous thing, but it's an intrinsically good thing because it means we are significant beings. What we do makes an impact, has a difference. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, for, for moral evil, that works well. Mm. Uh, the question is what you do with natural evil, which doesn't appear to have any human uh, components at all. If somebody gets struck by lightning, they're going to say, who are you going to blame that on? Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> what I want to do is to extend the free will argument so that it does cover uh, natural evil as well as as well, as well as moral evil. That, I think you have to do that. There are other, other moves you have to make as well, but I think that's an, a key one. Um, and the question is, of course, well, <laughs> who do you blame? Who done it? Uh, if, you can't blame it on the fall of Adam and Eve. If there's any truth to kind of modern biology at all, then there's been pain and killing and suffering and death in creation since long before human beings emerged, so it won't do to blame it all on us. Um, and, I, and that's where I was when I started the research. I thought, I cannot see a way around that. Um, and then I, I, I said, this is a real problem, because the Bible presents uh, everything as sweetness and light before uh, Adam and Eve rebel, whereas from science, science tells us that it's all been killing and pain and suffering and death since before human beings emerged on the sea. And then I had another look at, at the Bible and actually found it didn't say quite what I thought it said. Um, that it doesn't suggest everything was sweetness mm -hmm. and light and harmony and peace before uh, the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, there are various clues that suggest it wasn't like that. Um, partly, there's the serpent. Mm -hmm. However we interpret the serpent, here is a bit of creation already actively working against the will yeah. of God before human beings mm -hmm. sin. Um, so that's one of the whole clue, one of the whole piece of evidence. Um, and then Secondly, <clears throat> there's the command to fill the earth and subdue it. Some sense that there's already something that needs to be subdued, so already something that's gone wrong, already something that needs to be put right. Um, uh, and so I began to think that perhaps, perhaps the Bible and modern science were not quite as contradictory mm. uh, as I originally thought. So I was thrashing around, to be honest, and then I happened upon a little bit in a book by Eric Maskell, um, who was a mathematician, theologian. Um, <coughs> he had a section on evil and the fall. And he said, well, maybe uh, it helps here to draw on the old Jewish Christian tradition that there are other free, rational, intelligent agents in creation other than human beings. Maybe there's some truth to the language that Jews and Christians and Muslims all use about the angelic mm -hmm. and the demonic. Maybe there's some kind of substance to that language, and some kind of referent to, to that way of talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, maybe there is a bit of truth and substance to the Jewish and Christian tradition that there's been a fall, there's been a rebellion, a hiatus within that yes. uh, realm, within the spiritual dimension of creation. Uh, and the, the little bit that he's added beyond the Jewish and Christian traditions is maybe the different dimensions of creation are so interwoven and so interrelated that <coughs> what happens in one affects what happens in another. So a rebellion within the spiritual dimension of creation actually introduces disorder and conflict and struggle <coughs> into the physical orders of creation. And therefore, the cut and throat blood and gore of uh, the natural order is not the way God wanted sure. it. It's a result of the disorder introduced into creation um, by the angelic fall. So, I mean, this is a huge subject. We're going to have run out of time, but we want to give people some chance to ask some questions. Can I ask two questions mm -hmm. that result from that? One is, does that mean that you um, espouse the view that creation itself was in some sense an act of redemption? By which you mean? By which I think some scholars would say that that 
because of the hints that you've given mm -hmm. there, the, in a sense, the, 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 the sheer act of God making the world was actually in order through the plan of um, uh, salvation, ultimately, and, and ultimately on the new creation, God's way of sort of undoing what may have been a prior fall of, of the angelic host in the rebellion against God. Well, let me do my politician bit here. So that's a very interesting question. But the question, the more important question, <laughs> um, and I think and you may be a way of answering your question. Tell me if, if it isn't afterwards. Uh, I think what is the case is that he, the call of human beings, uh, the, the mission of human beings, is, is now not just to rule creation and to care for it, which it was always intended to be. It's now to put it right. It's now a therapeutic vocation. We are called to subdue the earth, and as well as to fill it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, in my scenario, if you like, is God begins the process of creation, that there's a rebellion within the spiritual dimension, that that distorts the whole way in which creation develops, introducing pain and killing and death and suffering and predation and disease. Um, that despite that mess, God draws into being uh, human beings who are and social enough and moral enough and um, physically dexterous and intelligent enough and have an awareness and enough of an awareness of God to reflect him mm -hmm. in, a, in a new way to be his image uh, and that it's then his calling that they should his intention that they should put right what's gone wrong mm -hmm. that instead of doing that um, they join in the rebellion and make it worse. If you want to see what it would have looked mm. like for human beings to have been faithful to that calling and to have put creation right, look at the person of Jesus. Mm. Here at last is a human being doing what human beings were called and created to do. Stilling the storms, healing the sick, mm. raising the dead, undoing the effects of the angelic fall. Uh, but as I say, they, they joined in the rebellion, they made things worse, and that's why um, Genesis 3 can say it's all our fault, yeah. even though these things were occurring before we appeared on the scene. Because had we been faithful to God's call upon us, we would have put things right. And so the continued occurrence of suffering and evil uh, is our fault, though its original occurrence was not. Mm. Uh, so that's how my, so so, roughly, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's where I wanted to go. Yeah. And which then just raises, I mean, they've got tons of more questions that yes. everybody does, I'm sure, but raises the other question, which is how do you understand the fall in Genesis 3 in, in the context of how you describe the origin of evil in that way? Um, I think the first thing to say is uh, not only that it's picture language, but that, it's, but that it says it is. Um, so it says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is not an oak tree, this is not a rhododendron, this is not an apple tree, it's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that is scripture saying, hello, I'm a symbol. Now, but the important thing, uh, and uh, the reason why that doesn't lead you off in all sorts of kind of liberal directions, is because it's symbolic of something that happened. It must mm. be symbolic of something that actually happened. Otherwise, God is again responsible for, for, for what has gone wrong. Um, evil is, is an occurrence. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a substance. It's an event, uh, and therefore, because we are, because creatures are historical, we're creatures of space and time, therefore, something must have happened in space and time, or the only other candidate for who's responsible is God. He's the only person who's outside space and time. So the fall, something going wrong, the first thing to go wrong must have been, in some senses, an historical moment. Um, otherwise, you have to, the only person you can blame is God. Mm -hmm. So, so that's is that the sort of yeah yeah no it's very helpful. I mean, I'm conscious that as you are as well that all of these has been off on a whole ton of other questions. So we will take people's questions in just a moment. Um, just to change gear, yes. hopefully without completely um, wrecking the gearbox in the process. But um, uh, how does this impinge upon your vision for for Wycliffe Hall and what you're doing um, in training men and women for ministry today? Well, I mean, I think. Uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Partly what I was saying earlier about um, people who will buy what they say, buy their theology, <clears throat> by their thinking in this area, but also by their living, um, show that God is on the side of people. And he's not against them. He's against what they do wrong, um, but he's not against them. He's a, and he's against what happens to them <clears throat> if it's destructive 
and voting for them and you know, and voting. Um, so the people are uh, embodying the message that God is on your side and it's your your friend, not your enemy and inflictor of mm. suffering. So I think that's partly it. Um, and I think probably uh, people who are committed to the putting right of creation, Christians, not just mm. clergy, but Christians need to be people who are committed mm. to the putting right of creation, who are doing it ecologically, who are doing it um, in terms of trying to reconcile people who are in conflict. Um, one of the things that Genesis 3 does is it suggests that the ultimate um, division between God and people then introduces all sorts of other fragmentations between people and people, and yeah. they blame each other, <clears throat> um, let children kill each other. Uh, that's a kind of sociological level. There's the ecological level of pain in childbirth and thistles and all the rest, obstructing the whole process of both reproduction and um, food production. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the psychological level as well. Uh, they, they, they feel na naked and ashamed. What's being ashamed other than being in conflict with yourself because a bit of you is not happy with another mm -hmm. bit of you. Uh, so uh, if we can put right the fundamental division between us and God, then the others can in turn be put right as well. So what I want to <coughs> From, from Wycliffe is people who are uh, evangelists, who would put, try and get us back into a right relationship with God, but who are also equally um, people who are reconcilers, mm -hmm. uh, peacemakers, as Jesus says, um, people who care passionately about ecology and, and not despoiling the planet that God has given us, um, and people who are both working towards and helping others towards mental health um, and psychological peace. Mm. So I think that is a kind of grand vision. Sure. Great. It's a great vision. Thank you so much. I mean, we, we could talk for hours, but I doubt we'd have anybody still watching. But um, <laughs> uh, we should take just a few questions from people now. Um, and um, thank you to those who've uh, logged on in order to provide questions. And I'm just going to retrieve a, a couple of them. Um, it's good you can remember your password. It is good. It does help. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so. <laughs> and mine might not be showing up here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so there's one here. If God is against suffering and pain, why does it happen? Um, does he then have no power? So we sort of skirted around the sovereignty um, responsibility discussion, which takes us there a little bit. And I wonder yes. whether you want to give a simple, coherent, conclusive, straightforward and answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd love to, but anyway. <laughs> you'll have to take this one. Uh, you'll have to take this one. Um, I think power, we, we need to be careful with the word power. Uh, we need to be careful not to do what pagans do and project onto a big screen human traits. <clears throat> what we need to do is not to project onto a cosmic screen human understandings of power. We tend to admire people who get their own way, people who um, are influential and, and what they say goes and what they say, what they say happens. <laughs> but that's basically a dictator. And I think God has a different concept of power, as we see in the person of <clears throat> Jesus. His concept of power is there in the cross. Uh, that's where you see God's power at work. And there he allows people to do things that he doesn't want them to do. There he actually takes that into himself, suffers it, allows it to happen, and thereby is transformative. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important not to see God as somebody who and dictates what happens. He allows other things to happen. He allows people to be free to be free. He allows relationships to be real and choices to be real and decisions to be real. Um, and then works with the consequences uh, to, to try and bring about a restoration of that harmony which was always his, his plan and his, his intention. Um, so is God sovereign? Yes, in the sense that he is the source of all power. He's the owner of all power, 
and he can call in all power and will do at the end of time. That's what judgment's all about and the putting right of all things. He has the power to put things right. Um, but he's not the sole user of power. Uh, if he were the only one who did anything, then, of course, this world would be perfect. But there would be no relationship. There would be no love. Uh, it would just be an extension of himself. He allows us to have freedom, to have real choices, uh, and respects those decisions, even when it's not in accordance with what he yeah. wills. Um, so the sovereignty uh, of God is his ownership of power, but he loans it to us and respects the use that we put to it. Um, that, that is it about as yeah. succinct as I can. Uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a big subject, so let's move swiftly on. Um, uh, so there's a question here. If we humans are almost as a figure of speech programmed to do wrong and God is against what we do wrong, would then we exist for God to correct us and to demonstrate his ability to cure all ills? Oh, that's a very good question and a, a, a whole set of good questions in fact. Um, I think we are wired to do wrong in the sense that um, human, human beings have built up a momentum uh, that once evil got underway, disobedience happened. Uh, you can see that actually kind of building up momentum even through the early chapters of Genesis. First of all, it's just disobedience, and then it's murder. Um, and, and then it's almost kind of goes on to a, a, a national and international mm. scale as you go through the opening chapters of Genesis. Um, so it is very difficult to resist that momentum. And what I think experience says is that you can do it in any one case. So we are responsible, but you just can't not do it at all. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, there is a kind of tension there, but that's what experience tells you. Um, so when we do something wrong, we know that we could have done otherwise and we should have done otherwise. Um, but we also know that if we try and be perfect for a day, mm. it doesn't we work. Do it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so now, we're, not, we're not free not to sin? We're not free not to sin, though we are free in every individual case, and that's a conundrum that mm. is, is difficult to uh, give intellectual uh, coherence to, but it is how we experience things, I think, and after all, intellectual coherence is there to give expression to, mm -hmm. to reality, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the fact is that there's one person who didn't, <clears throat> uh, who, who that moment was able to swim against that, the tsunami of the momentum of human evil, mm -hmm. uh, and so we cling on to him. Here's one person who can still live life the fully human way mm. without um, distorting it and besmirching it and begriming it and dishonouring their own intrinsic dignity and value. Mm. Um, and therefore we look to him and therefore we, we have to rely upon what he does ultimately, of course, in the cross. Sure. And, and that begins to undo that propensity by the work of the Spirit. Uh, and that work <coughs> will be finished off finally uh, at, the, at the second coming. That's when it will be complete. And we'll be free, but just be the sorts of people who no longer and I guess want to do what's wrong, because we've seen through it finally. And I guess the other thing about, um, you know, again, a lot more time would be good to spend on what actually happened at the cross, but one of the great encouragements is that God got down among us um, that... He identifies with our suffering, um, and you know it just takes the debate beyond the purely sort of philosophical question about the origin of evil to actually it is very personal. Um, we experience it personally, but actually God experienced it personally in sending His Son um, yes. for us too, which um, is the great encouragement of and wandering the cross. In the end, the answer to the problem of evil is not a theory. Mm. In the end, the answer to the problem of evil uh, is. God assaulting it in Christ, mm. and then asking us to join in that assault, mm. uh, and then finally, his, his putting right of all things. 
that was the ultimate answer for modern evil. Um, and if the intellectual arguments either don't work for you or whatever, mm. cling hold to this. That this is actually the real mm. answer to the problem of evil. Uh, God has assaulted it in, in the person of Christ as we see through the healing miracles, as we see through the <coughs> natural ma nature miracles, as we see primarily in the resurrection. Um, and and it, there's a lovely little uh, detail for those of you who know Greek. Um, that there's a bit in one of the um, Gospels, Mark's Gospel, of the man with the withered arm, mm. uh, and Jesus restores mm. that, that withered arm. And it's the same word that is used for the restoration of all things. Uh, so what... See it in miniature. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Here's a little bit done. Now what Jesus has done, what God has done through Jesus in this arm, he will do for the whole Gospels. That's mm. the promise. And here's a little picture, just a little glimpse of that coming day when mm. all things will be put right and back mm. into that harmony which was always God's intention. Mm. Good. We could keep talking. We could. Um, and as, as, we, as anybody else on our senior management team <laughs> will tell you. Absolutely. So I think before I need to leave it there, apologies, there are still a couple of questions. We've not quite dealt with, unsurprisingly. Well, that's surprising. um, but that's a great place to end, I think, with that, that hope and vision of what God's begun in Christ, you know, in a sense he will bring to full, uh, full fruition, which is, is really great news. And um, don't forget, if you want to know the full answer, then um, <laughs> this is where you find it. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a little break from our web broadcast for a few months, but we'll be back very shortly and more, more information on all of that on our website. Thank you. Thank you.